Aging, it's what we do and what I'm here to talk about today. In particular, addressing a recent paper that claims to test the information theory of aging that has come out from Davis Sinclair's lab at Harvard Medical School and claims to drive aging both forwards and backwards. So first I'll present the necessary background to the information theory of aging and how the authors describe their findings. Then we'll look at the data to see to what extent the data supports their viewpoint. And then we'll take a look at some other opinions. And then I'll say what I think and how I would test the information theory. Such fun. Such fun. <laughs> Wait for it. Such fun. There it goes. Such fun indeed. All right. So the first thing we need to address is this information theory of aging. If we break it apart, the main question you're probably asking is, well, what information? The classical view of information storage within a cell is pinned to our genome, DNA, that contains all our genetic information, three billion base pairs of it. DNA being stable, easily accessed for reading the information, and being used as a convenient copying method of semi-conservative replication, means that our genetic information is by and large preserved as we go from a fertilised egg to a grown adult. But while our cells have the same DNA, our cells are different. That comes down to what genes are being expressed, by how much and at what time they are expressed. What governs this gene expression control is currently thought to be epigenetic marks. Heritable, yet modifiable marks found in either DNA itself or in the proteins that compact DNA. Together, these proteins and DNA are referred to as chromatin. Take note as I'll uh, mention this later. And so one analogy that David uses in his book, Lifespan, to describe these epigenetic marks is that of a DVD. Yes, I still know what they are. Whereby DNA is likely the hardware, the information stored in the DVD, while the surface represents the epigenetic information. The disc can stay intact, but the information can get harder to read and get perturbed as the surface of the disc gets grubby or scratched. In short then, David's information theory of aging is that there seems to be a loss of this epigenetic information during aging that could be reversed, as in you can clean your DVD. <laughs> the consequence of this loss with regarding, regarding a cell is that gene expression and other cellular processes like DNA repair become faulty and it causes cells to behave aberrantly and lose their identity. Now David is not the only to propose that there is a connection between epigenetic changes and aging. In fact, epigenetic alterations is one of the hallmarks of aging and changes in DNA methylation are being used to build so-called DNA methylation slash aging slash epigenetic slash biological aging clocks, which I've discussed many times before. But are these epigenetic changes just a consequence of aging or a natural cause? Well, David's information theory of aging goes a step further and extends upon the simple scratching of a DVD analogy and suggests that these changes are due to the cellular response to DNA damage. DNA damage typically activates the world's coolest protein, that is, P53, and this includes its response to double-stranded breaks, as you can see here, whereby P53 is activated to mediate the DNA repair response, and this can result in epigenetic changes. And so, as described in David's book Lifespan, wherever epigenetic factors leave the genome to address the damage, Genes that should be off switch on and vice versa. Wherever they stop in the genome, they do the same, altering the epigenome in ways that were never intended when we were born. Cells lose their identity and malfunction. Chaos ensues. The chaos materialises as ageing. This is the epigenetic noise that is at the heart of our unified theory. And another term they use to describe this phenomenon is RCM, relocalization of chromatin modifiers. The idea that the protein factors that are involved in changing these epigenetic marks move to sites of damage and are therefore not where they should be because they're getting distracted, or if they try to return, they end up returning to the incorrect place. So this all sounds very great and sort of hand wavy, but how do we go about testing this? Well, you would want to see if you can find a way to advance aging by increasing the rate of these changes in epigenetic marks and then also show that you can slow down or reverse aging by restoring slash maintaining slash preserving slash conserving slash prolonging slash I'll stop reading the thesaurus, the epigenetic information. So how to do this? Well, the first appreciation of this theory, as David describes in his book, is that if the information theory is correct, 
that aging is caused by overworked epigenetic signalers responding to cellular insult and damage, it doesn't matter where the damage occurs. So you need to induce some sort of damage. And this brings us back to this recent paper where they describe the creation of a mouse strain that they call ice mice. Ice here standing for inducible changes to the epigenome. Now this point is really important. They wanted to make changes to the epigenome by causing double-stranded breaks. But double-stranded breaks can result in DNA mutations, another theory of aging, with a lot of evidence behind it. So they claim to have found a method that induces double-strand breaks that get repaired, causing changes to the epigenome, but the DNA sequence remains the same. This involved using an inducible system where they could control the, this effect with an exogenous enzyme, IPPA1, which David entertainingly describes in his book as an enzyme that comes from goopy yellow slime, and it floats around and cuts DNA at just a few places in the mouse genome. The cell has no problem pasting the DNA strands back together, leaving no mutations, which is exactly what we were looking for to engage the survival circuit and distract the sirtuins. Sirtuins are a family of proteins, some of which are involved in epigenetic marks, but that's as much as I'll talk about them today. Anyway, I feel like this explanation is already getting too long, so let's recap. They made a mouse strain. These mice contained an inducible enzyme that only gets activated if a cell receives the drug tamoxifen, a commonly used research tool. And when this enzyme gets activated, it causes double strand breaks in the genome. The cell accordingly fixes the damage, and in response to this, it could change the epigenetic marks slash distract the epigenetic factors from their usual roles, along with the information theory of aging slash relocalization of chromatin modifiers. So what happens? Well, I first learned about their results back in 20, mm, 2019, when I read Davis' book, where it says, the mice might have died, they might have grown tumours, or they might have been perfectly fine, no worse off than if they received a dental x-ray. Nobody had done this before in a mouse, so we didn't know. But if our hypothesis and epigenetic instability and ageing was correct, tamoxifen, remember this is activating this enzyme, would work like the potion that Fred and George Weasley used to age themselves in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. And it worked. Like wizardry, it did. And like one of my favourite scenes from Harry Potter, as you can see in these images, the mice that received tamoxifen for three weeks in four to six month old mice do look much older and performed worse in memory tasks. At 10 months post-treatment, these ice mice exhibited classic features of old age, including reduced body weight and fat mass, independent of food intake, and they had a lower respiratory rate during the day and decreased motion in the dark phase. But firstly, how did this treatment affect the cells? Well, firstly, not all of the cells of the mouse got damaged. I think that's important to point out, and that's just the limitation of the method that they used to activate the enzyme. So it's not clear how many of the cells received this damage response, but they've estimated that it was between 60 to 70% of cells within the muscle, liver, hippocampus and cortex, the latter two just parts of the brain. But I don't recall seeing information of other cell types, such as the immune system, which when prematurely aged in a separate paper through DNA damage, does drive senescence and aging. Now, the reason I went into so much detail to explain the system is that it is clearly an artificial way to induce damage. And long term, that they did see that this treatment caused the cells to become senescent and immune cells are involved in senescence clearance. So it would be interesting to see if they could do tissue-specific mouse strains where they had a better idea over what tissues they were actually damaging or artificially aging. But let's go back to see if they tested the theory, the epigenetics, did they change? Well, obviously there were some changes. In this paper, they profile the histone modifications, the, the proteins that wrap up DNA. And in some cells, they also look at the epigenetic age. So they looked at DNA methylation. And a long story short, they are different to mice that didn't get induced with the damage. So, so far, so good. So we see some epigenetic changes and we see the mice are older. However, it's still not clear if these epigenetic changes are correlating or actually causal for aging. So that brings us to the second test. Can you restore the pattern of epigenetic marks in the cells that got damaged? And to achieve this, they delivered three of the Yamanaka factors, OCT4, SOX2 and KLF4, using an adeno-associated virus to the ice mice. And then they looked five weeks later. They showed that levels of one mark, a histone mark, H3K9 trimethylation of cells in the kidney match control mice. But that's kind of like the only data they really present. 
So I have missed out a lot of their data figures, but frankly, this video is getting quite long and would require much explanation from my side to go through all of the plots. So let's hear first how the authors conclude, and then we'll move on to thoughts of others and my own. So the authors conclude that by introducing double strand breaks without causing mutations, we provide evidence that it is the cell's reaction to the damage and the resulting loss of epigenetic information that drives mammalian aging forwards. This would explain why aging proceeds through a predictable series of molecular and physiological changes, even though DNA damage can occur anywhere in the genome. Fortunately, it is now apparent that mammals retain a backup copy of youthful epigenetic information that can safely restore the function of old tissues akin to reinstalling software. So after reading this paper quite a few times, I agree that whatever they did to the mice caused them to display phenotypes that overlap with aging. What I don't fully follow is the erosion of the landscape in terms of the epigenetic information as something like cellular senescence does that already. And they seem to focus on histone modifications individually at different parts of the paper, which made it narratively quite hard to follow. But that isn't their main conclusion, of course. They also did this Yamanaka uh, rejuvenation later on in the paper. But I don't think they provide much data regarding that aspect. They didn't look at all the tissues and they didn't do any lifespan studies, which would have been the kind of obvious thing to do if they were able to both prematurely age and also rejuvenate the mice. But the authors are also aware of some of their limitations and they do say as well that they didn't determine which chromatin factors are relocalised, nor did we study chromatin contacts in vivo. That is to say this RCM relocalization of chromatin modifiers, part of their hypothesis, wasn't really tested or examined. So I don't think their data fully supports their overall claims of restoration of the epigenetic landscape information theory of ageing, but I don't think it disproves it. If anything, I just thought it raised more questions. And this paper also did cause quite a stir over on Twitter, but I think this quote by Jean Vey says it best. The jump that now ageing is a programme that can be wound backwards isn't justified by their research. But ultimately, you know, being the interested an informative researcher that I am. The, the key question is, well, if this method that they developed doesn't test this theory, how would we test it? Well, I did spend some time thinking about it, and the only thing I could think of was to use CRISPR activation and inactivation methods for precise epigenetic editing, because here you can modify the epigenetic marks in precise locations of the genome. I mean, this wouldn't be trivial to set up, and um, good luck, guys. I don't really know how you would do it, um, or why you would target it. But at least you would have a better understanding of what the cell's initial response would be, and there wouldn't be any double strand breaks. And so, yeah. <laughs> but the best part is, I have made a video on this tool before, so you can learn about it here. And with that, I hope you've learned something. Thank you to my Patreon supporters, and thank you for listening. But don't say such fun. Well, if it annoys you that much, no, I won't. Such fun. <laughs> such fun. <laughs> oh, a double.